Hello, I welcome you to the next part of this series of lecture that I am taking on Paul and his theology. In Paul's theology, when it comes to sacramentalism, there are two important sacraments about which Paul speaks. One is about baptism and the second is on Lord's Supper. As I discussed earlier with you in my previous lecture on Paul's understanding of the church, we find that these two sacraments that he speaks, about which he speaks, are closely connected to his understanding of the church itself. There are only two sacraments which the Lord instituted as per the biblical teaching. And these are the two sacraments on which Paul continues to speak in his letters. Of course, in Paul's letters, we do not have big section dedicated to uh, the teachings on Lord's Supper and baptism. But it is very clear to us that Paul held them important and whenever the occasion arose within the church and in his impartation of the teaching to the church, Paul feels free to refer to them. First, I will speak to you about Paul's understanding of baptism and then I will speak to you about Paul's understanding of Lord's Supper. Paul's understanding of baptism is explained within a particular context in Romans chapter 6 verse 1 following and then we find in Corinthians chapter 10 as passing reference made to baptism. The term baptism simply as we know means uh, comes from the Greek word baptizo, which simply means to dip or to splash into. And this is the meaning that probably reigns in the mind of Paul as he speaks about baptism in his letters. In Romans chapter 6 verse 1, this is what Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning? so that grace may increase by no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Now, when Paul speaks about it, he's speaking about the experience of conversion that we have, where we have repented from the sin and we have died. But this conversion experience that one has in Christ is now practically demonstrated through baptism and that is what it connects here Paul connects here in chapter 6 verse 1 of Romans or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death now this is the an important beginning he says in um, in, in, in Romans chapter 6 verse 1, he begins by saying, surely you know that. And it is actually direct reference to a, uh, it is a direct appeal to the common knowledge of the early Christians. It is not that the Roman believers did not know about baptism, but it is something deeper truth about that baptism that Paul is trying to explain in this uh, chapter in chapter 6 verse 3 when he says or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death this is a direct reference that Paul is making by using the term into or in into his death in baptism what is happening for Paul it is very clear this baptism is done in and into the name of Christ and it is symbolic of cleansing as he would speak in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 13 or chapter 6 verse 11 and maybe we can count Ephesians chapter 5 verse 26. The rite of baptism is actually an outward sign of admittance of fellowship into the church. It is actually an initiatory rite by which we declare that now here on I 
die to my past life, my sin, and now I become the member of the body of Christ where the ones who have experienced the resurrected life of Christ by faith come together and we form one body in Christ. So when Paul says in chapters, Romans chapter 6 verse 1, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Paul is actually saying, you know it. O Roman believers, you know it that when we were baptized, we were actually baptized into Christ Jesus. What does it mean into Christ Jesus? It is being born into a spiritual union in the space that is called Christ and all the believers in Christ Jesus are now added into this body of Christ. So we are baptized into Christ. Into Christ and how is that into his death. Now this is where the idea of the, the rite of baptism make, takes, uh, becomes so theologically so important. He says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now, Paul at this point when he speaks about baptism, he's referring to dying and rising up of Christ himself. And in baptism, it is when someone after the conversion or repentance from the sin and makes a declaration, uh, decides to live for Christ thereafter. It is the believer then undergoes a rite called baptism. And it is in baptism that one is actually testifying his inner experience that as Christ died and rose up on the third day into a new existence with a spiritual body, so also in baptism when a believer comes into the water, takes the dip into the water and he comes out. Actually, Paul says that it is like buried with him through baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So what is it meaning? This is an act just as in Old Testament prophets have practically demonstrated certain parables. In the same way, it is practically demonstrating the inner experience of the change or transformation that has happened. So by baptism, what is someone confessing before others, those who are witnessing it? It is simply that the inner experience of repentance from the sin is what I testify that by that regeneration that has happened within me, the rebirth that I've experienced by faith in Christ. Now I practically visibly demonstrate it before others that I die to this world and rise up with Christ into a new life. Now this language clearly shows us that Paul did not see this right as something magical, something magical happening. It is merely symbolic of the inner experience. There is nothing that by baptism someone is saved or someone is actually experiencing something supernatural in his being. But it is clearly symbolic of what has one experienced already within himself or herself is now he's only showing it out to the world. So one should not, according to Paul's understanding, associate anything supernatural to this uh, event of baptism, the rite of baptism. But it is a strong, great declaration of a greater spiritual reality that now onwards a believer who lives in this world is actually participating in the spiritual life in Christ Jesus thereby he receives spiritual nourishment but it also has a practical implication upon his or her life that is the put off and put on language that Paul uses repeatedly in uh, Romans as well as in 
Ephesians and Colossians that you find. It has a clear, practical, ethical implication to that. A believer who takes baptism is now actually showing or um, is now actually confessing before the world that he has experienced Christ and he is just like he, he takes off his dress in baptism and then wears a new cloth. So also through dying in Christ and rising up with Christ into the newness of life, one is actually throwing away the old nature of sin and now wearing a new nature in Christ Jesus to live in holiness. So that means this symbolic act that one practices in the presence of others is actually a practical declaration of the testimony of the inner experience with a strong commitment before the people and the church that I shall live here onwards as the one who has died to the sins of my past and now I decide to live in the newness of life into holiness and it is that which is nurtured it is that decision to live in Christ in the newness of life and with the new ethical standards that are taught by Christ and are based on his teachings it is to live in that that uh, it is to live in that we find our existence in Christ becomes so important for us then he says and this is what he says ethical implication of that I will read it aloud for you he says in verse 6 following of the same chapter now if we died with Christ we believe that we will also live with him for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead he cannot die again death no longer has mastery over him the death he died he died to sin once for all but the life he lives he lives to God then he says in the same way in the same way just as Christ died and rose up for once and for all never to die again so also in the same way count yourself dead to sin this is the command this is mandatory for a Christian to accept that through baptism the testimony that he bears practically in before the eyes of other fellow believers he has to or she has to count himself or herself as dead to sin but and alive to God in Christ Jesus it is the life within Christ after reposing faith in him into that new reality that one is living now onwards therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness rather offer yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness for sin shall no longer be your masters because you are not under the law but under grace. So what is this Paul trying to teach here? Paul is teaching them that baptism is a testimony of the inner experience which you practically demonstrate before others on one side and on the second side it is actually personal determination now to live in the life of holiness never offering one's own body into sinful acts but to decide to live every day in that holiness of the life that is shared in Christ Jesus so ethical living is important put off your old self or put on a new life because you have already buried yourself
you do not go back to that. Now while teaching these things, Paul also makes reference to something from the Israelite history. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, this is what Paul says. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were under the cloud and that they were passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock and accompanied them and that rock was crucified. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Now connected to this, Paul makes an, a reference to the Old Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 where he is actually speaking, connecting baptism, the experience of baptism with Israel. As Israel went through the sea and under the clouds, for him, Paul says that it is, they all were baptized into Moses in the same manner. Now that we undergo this experience of baptism, that we realize that we are baptized in Christ. Baptism is not empty symbol or bare sign, but a genuine sacramental action in which God works. So therefore, there are two sides of Paul's teaching. Number one, the ordinance represents the saving act and event of the gospel portraying the death and rising of Jesus. Secondly, Paul links preparation for baptism in stripping off the baptized one's clothes and subsequent investor of new clothing with the putting off of the old nature. This is teaching that Paul gave about baptism. The second important sacrament about which Paul taught is Lord's Supper. So now let us turn to the second sacrament taught by Paul in his letters that is Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper itself means that it is belonging to the Lord, the table that is laid before the church to participate and the invitation that goes out. It is in the name of the Lord. It belongs to the Lord and this is a different table than any other normal meals that we have because in Paul's teachings, the table of the Lord or the Lord's Supper has got special significance. In Lord's Supper, as we see in Paul's letters, the primary reference that we find is in chapter 11 verses 17 following and the remaining chapter of chapter 11. And we also find a passing reference in chapter 10 verses 1 to 3. Paul is now in both these places speaking about eating and drinking which is actually symbolic of again one's existence within the church. Eating and drinking in chapter 10 when he speaks about it is about participating, sharing in the table and as you drink and eat you are actually participating into someone. So, in the name of whom the table is identified, by participating in the table, you are actually participating with that being or with that person. So, when it is table of the Lord, then your participation, eating and drinking out of it is actually participating in the Lord. But if you are eating from the table of the demons that Paul says in chapter 10, then by eating and drinking out of it, you are participating into it. In this context, when Paul is speaking about Lord's Supper, he's speaking about something that is, that is done or performed in the name of the Lord. In the 
Jewish context or in the first century context when we read, the origin of the Lord's Supper is very interesting. Interesting it is because the Lord's table is not a new invention done by Paul or somebody else. Rather, even Jesus himself, as he speaks in the gospel narratives, gospel narratives um, mention it, even Jesus himself established this table of the Lord on the day of Passover while celebrating the liberation of Israel from the slavery of the Egyptian Pharaoh and their journey towards that promised land. So it is something which was already practiced and now it is taken further by Jesus and he gives it to it a new meaning. Now when Paul he comes to this Corinthians he is actually referring to something the tradition that he has already received. But in the first century table fellowship was common. It was practiced among Jews, it was practiced among the Gentiles. Among the Jews, a meal was actually a special time where one saw even a simple meal as a miniature form, a reflection of that greater messianic meal. On the other time occasions, like on Passover time, when a Jewish family gathered together, the eldest member, male member of the family household, presided over the meal and celebrated. They all celebrated. They recollected the story of God's amazing work in their history of their forefathers and of the nation. That how the Lord has led them out of their slavery in Egypt and took them to the promised land that God had promised to their forefather Abraham. Now when in the Hellenistic context we come, in the Hellenistic context also similar meals were celebrated. That is, when the guests were invited, they used to have a celebratory meal. Sometimes they used to have two parts of the same meal. One, which is a heavy meal that they used to have. And later on, smaller meal of maybe having a sort of dessert and then you know, uh, doing it in a lighter way. So it used to have two courses of celebration or of a meal when the guest was invited in the Hellenistic context into a family. Now, in the Corinthian context when Paul is teaching about the Lord's Supper, it is driven by something that has taken place already in the Corinthian church. The teachings about the Lord's table, now Paul has to give and it is given out because of certain things that were taking place among the Corinthians. The problem is that as Paul refers to in chapter 11 verses uh, 17 following, this is what he says, in the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meeting do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you and to some extent I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, it is not the Lord's supper you eat for when you are eating some of you go ahead with your own private supper as a result one person remains hungry and another gets drunk don't you have home to eat and drink in or do you despise the church of god by humiliating those who have nothing what shall i say to you shall i praise you certainly not in this matter. The problem in the Corinthian church probably was that the Corinthian believers did not understand the actual significance of the Lord's table. Rather, they probably took it as another meal that they were, they were, uh, they were um, having before coming into the Lord. So for them, it is a celebratory time. They must have celebrated their victory in Christ, forgetting the greater truth that the Lord's table is declaring about the death of Jesus. It is the remembrance of Jesus' death and his resurrection and our participation in that death and resurrection. And in Lord's table, 
we are actually by eating and drinking declaring of our membership in his body so paul says that when some of when you people gather together o corinthians some of you who have greater means or who can afford more you bring your food and then you go separately and you have your supper so much that you forget about the weaker one what is paul finding problematic among corinthians the problem that paul finds among corinthians is that now corinthians are losing the basic meaning or the emphasis of this right or the sacrament that was instituted for the church by the lord himself paul says that when you come to the lord's table you are not coming like you are coming to eat as you did in the past in your at your homes but in the church when you come together and participate in this lord's table you are actually declaring something special before others that is your fellowship in christ and your fellowship with your fellow believers how much do you relate with one another how do you relate with one another and corinthians behavior was such that it was actually breaking that fundamental truth that they had to declare by participating in the lord's table they when they ate supper together um, by themselves and enjoyed their meal when some one goes hungry and other is gets drunk the problem was that they were creating a clear distinction within the body of christ the rich could enjoy their meal so much and leave the poor to regret for the lack of resources that they have or the lack of food that they have probably some of the corinthians in the hellenistic background were coming with already prepared meal and they had a lavish meal earlier into which the poor ones could not join and later on when the poor ones come they did not have enough so by this time already the rich ones have celebrated and leave behind the poor ones to regret now paul is saying that this is wrong this is wrong when you come together by your participation in the bread and wine you are actually breaking away all the distinctions socio economic your uh, political identity your racial identity every sort of thing that creates bipolarity among you which distinguishes one from the other so much so that it causes division within the church uh, uh, that is contrary to the practice of the lord supper lord supper is actually declaration of the unity that one feels just as one bread is broken so also that we all are members of that one body and this is what paul is trying to teach now in verse 23 when he says for i have received from the lord what i also pass it on to you paul is mentioning that he has received it now some could argue that this is a direct revelation that paul received from the lord and it is that revelation that paul is teaching but not necessary it may not be that way because the lord supper was already instituted by the lord on the night of passover and then it has been practiced in the church as acts of apostles bears testimony to that so now paul is not actually receiving something from the testament uh, by the direct revelation that he received from god rather it is the tradition that was handed over to him and now he is make now he is appealing to that he says for i received from the lord that is the lord who has instituted it and given it to the church and now paul says it is actually receiving it from the lord itself what i also pass it on to you the lord jesus on the night he was betrayed he took bread so paul is actually referring back to that same passover night when the lord took his disciples to the upper room and then he broke bread with them and he gave a new meaning to the jewish passover and then that is what later on came to be celebrated within the church now when paul is speaking about 
the Lord's table. He is telling them the Lord's table is not just the celebration of the victory of Jesus upon the cross, but it is actually the remembrance of Christ himself. What does he say? He says that and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The words of Jesus are quoted and the emphasis is it is remembering what he has already accomplished on the cross. So it is not just the victory that Christ has gained through his death, but it is actually what he has accomplished for us. And that body which is broken, his body that was broken upon the cross, which is for you, that means the death of Jesus Christ, which was for your salvation. It is that act upon the cross that you must remember. And this body, this bread, actually after giving thanks is symbolic of that body which was broken for you upon the cross. And then later on he also referring to the cup he says, after supper he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Now the word covenant is again important. It goes back to Exodus chapter 24 verse 8 where blood was actually symbolic of the sacrifice that is made and by which a new covenant is inaugurated. Just as in Exodus chapter 28 uh, uh, just as in Exodus chapter 24 verse 8, the blood is shed as a sacrifice in the same manner. Paul is saying that now Jesus' blood that is shed upon the cross is actually a new covenant. A covenant which begins a new era for his people who are brought together from different backgrounds, non-Jewish backgrounds, racial backgrounds and they are brought and formed into a new people of God. So it is a new covenant that God is actually making through the death of Christ Jesus upon the cross. So the blood that is shed is a new covenant, new covenant and the command is do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So, when he repeats it in remembrance of me, the words of Jesus, what is Paul trying to emphasize is that it is simply recollecting what Christ has performed for your and my sins upon the cross. It is remembering that how by breaking of his body and by shedding of his blood, he has established a new covenant for us. And he has brought forgiveness of sins for us and how he has united all into his body and thereby he has provided a way of salvation for us. It is that needs to be, it is that which we must remember when we are doing, participating in the Lord's Supper. Paul is very clear about it. And what is important in this is that by eating and drinking in it, we do not sin against the body. So we must be very cautious. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, he will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. What is it? What body is it? Is it the physical body of Christ or is it the church that is the body of Christ? We are not clear about it. It could be either way that when you and I, according to Paul, participate in the table in an unworthy manner, in a casual manner, it is a sin against the very body that is broken for us upon the cross for our salvation and the blood that is shed which gives us the right to be the members of the people of God. It is a sin against that. or. Even it could also mean that when you participate in this unworthy manner in this table, 
you are actually committing sin against your fellow brothers and sisters within the church. So Corinthians, when you take your supper, move away into separate place, eat well, get drunk and you do not care for your brother who is poor. You do not think about him or her, then you are not only committing sin against Christ who has broken his body and shed his blood to save this person also you are violate you are sinning against the body and blood of christ and also you are sinning against this brother whom christ has brought together into this covenantal relationship to form the one people of god through his blood through his body so in the lord's supper one must be very cautious that he or she does not sin against the body of Christ because if that is done in an unworthy manner the punishment is sure to come everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup for those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment upon themselves participation for Paul in the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner is sure to incur God's judgment. So what must one do? One must actually judge oneself, discern oneself and examine and by examining one should make sure that he or she is worthy. The evil ways that once he had to, he has decided to leave aside after baptism or during baptism he or she has practically witnessed, testified before the people that I die to the sin and rise up to the newness of life must be lived here and now. One who is not living in this newness of life here and now in Christ is not participating in the Lord's table in a worthy manner. Judgment, according to Paul, is sure for such people. So what must one do? One must examine oneself. Check each aspects of life. Set those things right. Shun from all evil ways. Live according to the teachings of Jesus. Live in holiness. And then come and extend your hands to the Lord's table. Then that is the worthy way. If not, you will be judged. You bring judgment upon yourself. Or this is how he says that drinking judgment on themselves. It is not God who is judging and condemning you. Rather, your unworthy act at the Lord's table is actually inflicting God's judgment upon oneself. You invoke or I invoke, according to Paul, God's judgment upon oneself by our unworthy act at the Lord's table. That is why Many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. For Paul, the Lord's table is a fellowship. It's a fellowship where all the polarities existing in this world is overcome. Simply because at Lord's table, we all are brought together by the salvific death of Christ upon the cross where his body was broken, his blood was shed for us. He has made a new covenant with all the people to make a new people of God, a new community where one is sensitive to the other. It is a fellowship with God through Christ Jesus. It is a fellowship with your brother and sister who is now equal shareholder in God's grace available through Christ Jesus. Lord's table is a place where you remember his death, not just you celebrate his victory upon the cross, but you remember him who died for us upon the cross. We do not weep, we do not lament for his death, rather we thankfully remember with gratitude we remember what christ has accomplished for you and me upon the cross
and in Lord's Supper, we declare that because Christ died for the whole humanity, now it is a fellowship with all other members of the body of Christ who have now reposed their faith in Christ and have become the part of this new community of God. It has to be celebrated until he comes. So, Lord's Supper is not just an act of remembering the past event, but it is also a time of hope that when we participate in this Lord's Table, we make a declaration that until now Christ has not come. When Christ shall come, then this Lord's Table shall not be existing anymore. But until he comes, this has to be constantly done. This has to be regularly practiced with a prayer. Maranatha, our Lord, come. That is the prayer of every believer who is born in Christ. The Lord's Supper, when he participates, he declares that Christ has not come till now, but we look forward for that day, that the salvation that he has provided to us and how he has united all the people from different cultural, socio-political, religious and racial background, ethnic backgrounds, how he has united all. We all look forward for that day when he will come to gather his people with him into that great festival time when the Lord will have with us in that heavenly places. It is the tradition that he received from the other apostles who have witnessed Jesus conducting the Passover meal on that night and giving new meaning to that. And now he brings out a greater meaning, greater, deeper truth of that to the Corinthians, exhorting them that do not behave like the people who do not, who are not part of this meal or do not partake in this Lord's table, just as you participated in any other meal, rather understand this is a sacrifice that is done for you and others. So have fellowship with God through Christ Jesus and have fellowship with brothers and sisters of all other backgrounds in Christ Jesus. So extend your hands into it in a worthy manner. Examine yourself, test yourself, get repented, set your life right and then come. Paul gave a lot of importance to Lord's Supper because the church that he was establishing among the Gentiles could actually be a vibrant community of God only if the meaning of baptism could be understood and only if the central message of the Lord's table could be practiced among them. It is only then that they become one community of God and they learn to live together as the people of God. Thank you.